Welcome to the kickoff for this academic year's GW Biomedical Cross-Disciplinary Seminar Series. The goal of this seminar series is to promote networking and collaboration in translational health among researchers, healthcare providers, and policymakers from different disciplines to shift the paradigm from seeking a cure to developing a strategy of prevention. This year's topic is preventative cardiology, for which the GW Office of Integrative Medicine and Health has partnered with the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center and the Department of Medicine. A special thank you to Alan Wasserman and Bill Borden for their assistance with the planning. Rightfully, Bill will be our first speaker in this series. To see the full lineup, you can visit our website, which I will put in the chat for you shortly if Janet doesn't beat me to it first. William Borden, MD, FACC, FAHA, is the interim chair of the Department of Medicine, professor of medicine and health policy at the George Washington University, and the chief quality and population health officer at the GW Medical Faculty Associates. He specializes in preventative cardiology, the treatment of complex cholesterol disorders, and diagnosing and treating general cardiovascular diseases. In addition to practicing cardiology, Dr. Borden leads the GW Medical Faculty Associates initiatives to provide high quality, appropriate patient-centered care. Dr. Borden previously served as a senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and as a medical officer at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Dr. Borden's research focuses on policy approaches to improving quality of care and has been published in journals such as JAMA, JAM Internal Medicine, Circulation, and the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. He serves as an associate editor of Circulation, Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes. Dr. Borden is also an active volunteer with both the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. Dr. Borden received his undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania and his medical degree from the Johns Hopkins University. He completed his internal medicine residency and cardiology fellowship at the University of Chicago, where he also served a year as chief medical resident and, entered, and also earned an MBA. Wow, you were really busy. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Borden is board certified in cardiovascular diseases and clinical lipidology. Today, Dr. Borden will be presenting on translating lipidology into preventative care. Welcome and thank you so much, Bill. Well, thank you, Lee, for the, the really nice uh, kind introduction um, and for uh, developing this series and engaging uh, Alan Wasserman and me, Alan Wasserman and me in, in thinking through some of this. So. Uh, I've looked through the, the curriculum for the year and already what you have in place looks amazing. So, um, and I really love the idea of this cross-disciplinary series because, you know, that's really how we advance um, science and public health and medicine. And I think particularly in a space like uh, prevention. Um, so let me share my slides here. Um, let's see, I don't, oh, here we go. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I went into cardiology fellowship and I was convinced uh, that I was going to be an interventional cardiologist. I loved being in the cath lab and, um, you know, racing in the middle of the night and uh, opening up arteries for patients who came in with acute myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. And it saved lives. I mean, it was really incredible uh, work. Um, what I came to realize is um, there's so much that could be done to prevent a person from ever having to come in in the middle of the night with a heart attack. And similarly, even after something like a heart attack, there's so much that could be done to prevent it. And, and I spent some time in a preventive cardiologist practice, and you know, he had patients who had had heart attacks 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, I'd, I'd see these patients and they weren't going back for more stents and they weren't going for more bypass surgery and they weren't having more heart attacks. And so I really began to see the power of uh, preventive cardiology. And a, a big piece of this was around the lipidology and the, the cholesterol management. There are many aspects to preventive cardiology, but that lipid management is a big part of it. And, um, and it's what uh, got me really passionate about the field that I have gone into. So, um, so in today's talk, certainly jump in. Anyone has questions or comments along the way, it can be really informal. Um, so, uh, but it is gonna be a little bit more of a clinical talk today. And so if there are aspects that are um, too clinical or don't make sense uh, for people who are not clinical, please raise your hand or jump in or 
and uh, happy to explain that further. But uh, hopefully, it'll be uh, informative in the work that you all do. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, with that, I have no disclosures. And I'm going to start with a case of a patient who I saw several years ago. So um, this is a, a 63-year-old man with history of coronary artery disease and a history of a, what's called a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, a, a form of a heart attack. And so it was interesting. So this man was from an, uh, not originally from the United States. Uh, he was a researcher. Um, and his son was a medical student. His son was like that. He'd had a heart attack in the past. You need to be on medicine because he was on no medicine. And you need to be seeing a cardiologist because he wasn't under the care of a cardiologist. And so he, he agreed to uh, come in and see me. And when he came in to see me, I went to shake his hand. And I noticed um, these here. Let me see if I can uh, see. Uh, I noticed these here on the extensor tendons of his hand, these nodules. And so I asked him about them and he said, you know, I used to work for a surgeon and the surgeon said, oh, you know, I'll cut those off and he opened them up and cut them up. They were gone and then they grew back. Um, and this is the, his elbow, the extensor tendon of his elbow. And you can see this, this kind of mass here on his elbow. And then this is his Achilles tendon, which if you kind of reach down and feel your own Achilles tendon, it's, you know, it's maybe, you know, half a centimeter across. So his was about two and a half centimeters across. And so these findings are really characteristic of something called uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. So this is a genetic inherited disorder um, where there is a defect in the LDL receptor. The LDL receptor uh, sits uh, on uh, is uh, something that sits on the hepatocytes, the liver cells, and sort of captures LDL particles, grabs and pulls them uh, into those cells um, so that that cholesterol can eventually be removed from the body. Um, people who have a, a defect, if they have one defect, it's called heterozygous familiar hypercholesterolemia. They have you know, very high LDL levels in the two, 300 range. Um, and this is relatively common. So it's about one in 300 or so people in the US. So in a primary care practice, a primary care provider is gonna see these patients. I see them you know, even more frequently in a cardiology practice. Um, and this is manageable. And I, I mentioned this because we're gonna come back to this later in the talk, because uh, it factors into the guidelines as a, a group identified a particularly high cardiovascular risk um, requiring um, active management. There is also a homozygous version of familiar hypercholesterolemia, um, which is really a devastating disease where there are no LDL receptors um, and LDL levels can be you know, up to a thousand. Uh, and here, um, these, this is a very aggressive disease where uh, people can develop coronary disease you know, in their uh, elementary school years, early teenage years. Um, it is generally treated with um, something called LDL phoresis, which is sort of a dialysis to remove the cholesterol. Fortunately, this is more rare. It's about one in a million. So there are only about you know, 300 or so of these patients in the US. And they're generally managed by pediatricians um, because uh, they present so early in life. So today I'm gonna go through four areas. I'm gonna talk about uh, a little bit about uh, lipid uh, particles and then their role in atherosclerosis. Um, talk about risk stratification, uh, talk about guideline management, and then uh, one particular novel treatment uh, that is uh, really actually not so novel anymore, but um, really has been uh, tremendously beneficial. So uh, first, let's talk about atherosclerosis. And as I go into this for the, those basic and translational researchers in the room, if I get anything wrong here, correct me on this. I've come to this from a clinician's perspective, but um, when we talk about uh, lipoprotein metabolism, there are basically five main elements. So these four that you see here, uh, phospholipids, which are two fatty acids uh, with a phosphate head group, uh, free cholesterol. Um, and then there are uh, triglycerides, which are three fatty acids uh, and a glycerol backbone. And then there are cholesterol esters, which are um, basically uh, cholesterol esterified with a fatty acid. And then proteins make up the last component. And that's essentially what uh, the building blocks are. 
And so when you put those together into a lipoprotein structure, you have a phospholipid shell, free cholesterol in the surface, um, because that is polar, and then the nonpolar triglycerides and cholesterol esters in the center. And then you have uh, different forms of apolipoproteins on the surface that bind to different enzymes and receptors. And so this is the basic structure. And so when we talk about uh, LDL cholesterol or HDL cholesterol, the cholesterol is the same. It's just what particle is carrying that cholesterol. Um, and different ratios of these triglycerides or cholesterol, cholesterol esters and um, different types of those apolipoproteins are what determine uh, the different types of particles. So when we look across the, the various types of particles, we have over here the smallest, most dense, and up here the largest, least dense. And you can see they break down into those classes of HDL, uh, LDL, uh, intermediate density lipoprotein, BLDL, and then chylomicrons and chylomicron remnants. And uh, when you look at this and how, when we measure, measure in a standard clinical lipid profile, how these break down, and, and basically, uh, HDL are considered anti-atherogenic, so they help um, prevent against uh, atherosclerosis, whereas everything to the right here, LDL, triglycerides, um, particularly those chylomicron remnants, are all pro-atherogenic, so those are the, the uh, harmful aspects of the lipid particles. And so when we um, look at how this is measured, uh, we use the Friedewald formula. So um, in typical uh, practice, when you order a lipid panel, um, you get a measured total cholesterol, a measured HDL, and then a measured triglycerides. And then the, from the triglycerides, you can estimate the VLDL, and then with just rearranging the formula, you can then calculate the LDL. And in this formula, the way that you're able to get at that VLDL is by taking the triglycerides and dividing it by five, because in VLDL, there's about a five to one ratio of triglycerides to cholesterol. Um, so, but where you run into trouble is if those triglycerides are very high, because if you have triglycerides that are very high, then that ratio can become more like six or seven or eight to one instead of five to one. And so then the estimate begins to fall apart. Um, but clinically, a question that often comes up is does a patient need to be fasting um, to get their blood drawn? And the answer to that most often is no. So in say a primary care clinic, the patient has an appointment at three in the afternoon, you know, don't, uh, you know, uh, put them through that to have to fast until 3 p.m., get the lipid panel drawn. The vast majority of times it is just fine. Uh, but if that triglycerides are very high, then at that point you can have them come back for a fasting lipid panel. So that's a brief overview of just the lipoprotein metabolism and how that applies. Um, because then as we start thinking about the development of atherosclerosis, it is these lipoproteins that start depositing in, uh, in the vessel wall, in the endothelium, um, that uh, starts developing plaque. And you can see that this begins really in the first decade of life. And there are studies of soldiers who are killed in action, um, 18, 19 year old soldiers, and seeing not only uh, uh, fatty streaks, but already uh, atheromic lesions developing even in those late teenage years. So we know this develops over a lifetime. And our goal is um, to delay the development of this and to slow the development of this atherosclerosis and modifying risk factors like high cholesterol is an important way to do that. So how this plaque develops, um, so initially you get endothelial dysfunction, so, but things like risk factors like hyperglycemia and diabetes or smoking leads to more of this endothelial dysfunction. And monocytes um, enter through the endothelial cells into the subendothelial space and transform into macrophages. Um, there you get more lipid deposition over time. In development of this fatty streak is those macrophages become foam cells. Um, the body tries to heal this by um, trying to establish a fibrous cap to contain this lipid-laden core. But over time, as that uh, as the plaque and that lipid core grows, um, you begin to release different inflammatory 
uh, mediators that begin to break down that fibrous cap. And ultimately what happens uh, is, is that you get a rupture of that fibrous cap, exposing then this lipid core to the bloodstream where you then get platelet aggregation um, and initiation of the uh, coagulation cascade, which then leads to a thrombus. And then that thrombus occludes the entirety of the blood vessel, cutting off blood flow to the downstream uh, myocytes. And then you get myos uh, myocyte ischemia and infarction and myocyte death, which is what is a heart attack. So that's obviously what uh, we want to try and avoid. And so as I mentioned, um, you know, we know that this process begins over a lifetime. And so um, one of the key ways in starting this is risk stratification and understanding which of our patients are at higher risk. So I'm gonna present uh, a case here. And this is uh, a patient is seen in primary care clinic um, who is a 50 year old woman who wants a checkup. She's asymptomatic, doesn't really do exercise, uh, eats what she describes as a reasonable diet, though it's always helpful to do uh, a dietary history to understand what that means because we all kind of define a reasonable diet in different, different ways. But one of the main reasons she's here is that her mother, uh, thank you, Lee, I see you applauding that. We're, we're on the same page there. Um, mother had a heart attack at age 50. So obviously she's concerned, she just turned 50. Um, she has hypertension or high blood pressure on medicines. Uh, she's not a diabetic, she's a non-smoker. Um, she is obese by calculating her BMI of 31. Her blood pressure is not particularly well controlled at 140 over 90 despite the medicines, heart rate is 74. And then if you look at her cholesterol numbers, her total cholesterol is 190. Uh, her HDL, her good cholesterol is 45, triglycerides are 150, and her LDL is 115. So what, what do we advise this patient um, you know, with that LDL 115? Should she go on a statin? Should she just continue working with lifestyle modification? You know, how, how do we advise her? So one of the ways to risk stratify is to go to Boston, go 22 miles to the west of Framia, Massachusetts, and go back to 1948. With the, frame, with the start of the Framingham Heart Study, which was really fundamental in helping us understand what are those risk factors for atherosclerosis. Because um, at that time, it wasn't even necessarily known that things like smoking, high cholesterol, high blood pressure uh, led to atherosclerosis. And the major risk factors that came out of that Framingham Heart Study are the ones that you see here. And I could show you multiple slides of additional uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. But these were the ones that have really stood the test of time and in different populations as the main risk factors uh, for cardiovascular disease. Um, and this goes into different calculations. So um, initially what was used was something called the Framingham Risk Score, which would initially was in kind of tables and you can go like down and across in the table and add up the points and and then when I was in medical school, you know, we, we had Palm Pilots. They weren't even connected to the internet. So we thought we were very cool at the time because we could impress our attendings by calculating the premium risk score on our Palm Pilots. Now, of course, uh, this calculation is available, um, you know, online, on phones, uh, EHRs have this built in automatically um, to get you that, uh, that risk scoring. And the one that's used today is um, what's called the, um, 10 year ASCVD risk. And so this is calculating what the risk is at 10 years of a heart attack or stroke. So this is one calculator for the American College of Cardiology. It uses the same underlying uh, formula that was published in the guidelines I showed you previously. And here I plugged in the information for our patient that we talked about. And you can see here that her risk at 10 years is 6.2%. Uh, or another way to present this to patients is that out of 100 patients like her, um, a little over six of them would have a heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years. But then when you see her lifetime risk, it's 39%. So, um, you know, the significant risk that at some point in her lifetime, she will have a heart attack or stroke. So this is one uh, major risk uh, the scoring system. And this is key because this plugs into the guidelines. But this is not the only way to assess someone's risk. And so I'm gonna go through a couple other 
uh, risk stratification uh, approaches. So this one I particularly like is um, uh, looking at someone on their 50th birthday. Now, our patient here just turned 50. And on someone's 50th birthday, uh, if you look and see how many risk factors they have, and for patients who have two or more major risk factors, on average, people, uh, women live to age 81 and men live to age 78. And this is, you know, uh, almost 15 years ago. Um, so the numbers have improved a bit since then. But as you start peeling away risk factors to the point where you get to all optimal risk factors, women and men on average live into their 90s. You know, and that's an eight plus year difference for women and a 11 plus year difference for men. So it goes to show that we can't just think about risk factor modification later in life, but this is over a lifetime. And so a lot of the public health interventions have been focusing on uh, heart healthy uh, li uh, lifestyle behaviors, even in childhood, so, um, or medically in the pediatrics. Um, so thinking about as we uh, looked at that atherosclerosis development beginning earlier in life, this doesn't mean to say that someone who's 50 and you know, has risk factors that all hope is lost, it's certainly not. Um, there's a lot that we can do to modify these risk factors, but it does speak towards this concept of lifetime risk um, and uh, wellness and activities earlier in life. So other ways that we can look at risk, um, we can look at something called a highly sensitive or ultra sensitive CRP, C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a uh, inflammatory uh, marker in the body. And when you look at very low levels of elevation in someone who doesn't otherwise have inflammation going on, um, this can be helpful to further discriminate risk. And so if you look here, so someone who is a five to 9% Framingham risk, you know, similar to our patient whose risk is 6.2%, if that high sensitivity CRP is elevated, it bumps the risk up into the 10 to 15% range. So and as you'll see in the guidelines, that is a meaningful difference um, that might indicate then that that patient would be indicated for uh, statin therapy. And then you can see on the right that the CRP is uh, informative across the full range of uh, cholesterol levels. And you can take this number and plug it into another risk calculator, something called the Reynolds risk score, which has been shown that if you add in the CRP and also uh, a record of the patient's family history, that you can then get an even better risk prediction than that baseline Framingham or 10-year ASCVD risk score. Uh, another uh, scoring that I think is actually has even better data behind it is something called coronary calcium scoring. So uh, if you recall when we showed earlier the development of atherosclerosis in the, in the blood vessel, that healing that happens, that fibrous cap, um, over time, the body tries to further heal that essentially damage to the vessel um, by laying down calcium. And we can do a CAT scan of the heart, which measures that calcium and calculates a score called the Agustin score. And this is very instructive in terms of uh, the risk of cardiovascular events in the future. And so I think this is probably one of the best risk stratification tools that we have. And this also can be plugged into a calculator. This is out of the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. Um, in order to uh, be able to better differentiate uh, someone's risk. Um, and one thing that comes up is that obviously a CT scan has uh, radiation associated with it. And this is some interesting work that um, Dr. Andrew Choi in cardiology here at GW has done, looking at kind of a standard radiation dose um, to a low dose radiation CT scan and found almost perfect agreement uh, between that higher dose and the lower dose. And so nowadays the, the CT scan uh, that we do is about equivalent to uh, a mammogram and it's a pretty low dose CT scan. And if we think about a mammogram as a commonly accepted amount of medical radiation that we can use for preventive measures, this is in that range. So this is part of that discussion that I have with patients. But overall, whether you're thinking about the C-reactive protein or the, the CT calcium scoring, um, this is something that we do when uh, a patient is at intermediate risk and we're trying to determine, are they at higher risk and we should definitely be more aggressive in treating their cholesterol, perhaps with adding on a statin, 
or are they lower risk? And we can just continue working with lifestyle interventions alone. We don't use these if someone's already high risk, because we know that's the case, or someone's already low risk, um, because then this testing wouldn't add any additional information that would change our management. So with that, why don't we uh, go from there and jump into the guideline management? So, and you'll see how this builds together the risk stratification into uh, how we apply that uh, clinically in managing patients. So um, if we look again at our patient. So her 10-year ASCBD risk is 6.2%. And if all her risk factors were optimal, it'd be significantly lower at 1%. And you can see her lifetime risk is high at 39%, as we talked about. So um, thinking about this first, what, what's our motivation? Why do we want to look at um, you know, trying to modify that risk? Well, when we look at heart attack deaths from 1980 to 2000, they decreased by 50%. And about half of that came from treatment. So my colleagues who do race in in the middle of the night and treat heart attacks, and my colleagues who treat heart failure after a heart attack, um, really you know, life-saving work. Um, but we also saw was that 50% of this 50% reduction, so 25% came from prevention. And when we look at prevention, um, the biggest factor were decreasing cholesterol levels. So I'll uh, lay out the other preventive measures, but that's why, at least in today's talk, focusing on cholesterol management, um, though each of these additional elements could have their own uh, lecture course uh, specialization with them. So decreasing blood pressure, decreasing smoking, decreasing sedentary lifestyles, which is a bit of a double negative, it means getting people up and moving more. Um, and that's offset, though, by an increase in weight um, and what's got hand in hand with that, which is an increase in diabetes. And in fact, looking at national statistics in recent years, we've seen a decrease in actually an uptick um, in uh, a decrease in this, the decline of mortality rates and a, in a slight uptick, actually, in recent years, which has been linked nationally to the increase in weight and the increase in diabetes. And so, um, you know, knowing now the motivation and why these are so important to improve cardiovascular outcomes, we look at the most recent guidelines on the management of blood cholesterol um, and uh, how that's used to reduce cardiovascular risk. So first and foremost are the lifestyle intervention. So here is kind of a summary of some of the data on diet therapy. Um, and I know, uh, you know, Lee could lead many lectures uh, much more eloquently than I could talking about the data behind a diet and, uh, you know, and its, and its helpful effects. Um, but, you know, there are certain categories where we know that there is evidence of harm and we know certain categories that there is evidence of benefit, like green leafy vegetables. And then there's a bunch in the middle that are inconclusive at this point. Um, while the, the, you know, the discussion, uh, the literature and the experts on this are somewhat mixed. I am a pretty strong believer in the whole food plant-based diets. I think that there's strong evidence behind it. You look at even something like the Ornish diet, um, where you were able to demonstrate not only reduction in cardiovascular events, um, but using something called intravascular ultrasound, where um, you go in with a small ultrasound catheter into the coronary arteries and you can actually see regression in the coronary plaque. So I think that that is the best approach and I encourage my patients to, to work their way towards that. Um, an alternative would be something called the Mediterranean diet, which shares a lot of elements with that whole foods plant-based diet. So low and very low in red meats, low in saturated fats, you know, high in vegetables, whole grains, using some olive oil. Um, and sometimes that may be easier or more manageable for patients to do, fitting in with their life if it involves travel or eating out. Um, and so, um, you know, a big part of counseling on uh, diet, exercise, and other lifestyle interventions is um, both encouraging patients and also understanding where they're at, because you could prescribe a whole food plant-based diet, but if it doesn't work with their lifestyle, they're not going to do it. And so uh, trying to work with people on uh, what's something that fits in with their life. When you look at exercise, um, you can see that there is a, a drop in cardiovascular mortality as you get to um, increasing levels of physical activity. Um, and so the recommendations out of uh, guidelines 
are at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise, which you can see listed there, which can even be brisk walking. And I counsel my patients that if you're walking outside, if it's with the dog, you know, make sure you're getting at least 30 minutes of not having the dog stopping and then sniffing and doing their business. And, you know, if you're walking in the city, you should be passing some people along the way to make sure that it is that, that brisk walk and at, at a minimum of 30 minute intervals. And then if it's more vigorous exercise, at least 75 minutes a week. Um, and so you can see these listed here. And I think that's manageable for people. And again, with getting this to fit in with people's lifestyles, you know, so if someone takes the Metro to work and they already have to walk, you know, 10 minutes from the Metro, I say, you know what, take a detour. So um, you're adding 20 minutes to that walk to the Metro. Um, and while it's a little bit longer, you're already doing 10 minutes, then you're getting in that minimum of 30 minutes. Um, but it's only adding 20 minutes to your already busy day. So thinking about ways that people can incorporate these lifestyle interventions um, into their busy lives. And then I always talk about stress reduction, which I'm sure no one on this Zoom has any stress, um, but uh, th this is really important. And you look at heart disease patients, and uh, this study compared usual care, aerobic exercise training, and stress management and found that both the aerobic exercise training and the stress management training were better than usual care uh, with less emotional distress and depression and improved cardiovascular function. Unfortunately, they didn't compare the stress management to the aerobic uh, uh, training to, or the, the combine of the aerobic exercise training and the stress management. Um, but we know that aerobic exercise training can also be a good stress reducer. And so I talk with my patients about managing stress with uh, aerobic exercise, um, with things like yoga, meditation, using apps like uh, Headspace or Calm or others um, to lead through guided uh, meditations, which can help. So um, I do think this is an important part of cardiovascular risk reduction. But even with all of this, it does sometimes come down to, as one of my colleagues said, the tablets. Um, and when we're talking about medications, it's again, uh, in addition to that lifestyle intervention, and uh, first and foremost, and our thereafter is statin, statin, statins. These are incredibly effective medicines that have been around since the 1980s. There are um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, patient years and studies showing that these medications are safe, uh, effective, and saving lives. Um, the main side effect with statins are muscle aches, which happens about one in 10 to about one in 20 people. And there are ways to manage through that. Um, in addition, there are new medications that are available that I'll talk about at the end um, to address this. And the interesting thing about statins is, is that you can basically dial in the amount of LDL reduction that you want by picking the right statin at the right dose. And so when I work with medical students and residents and cardiology fellows, I go through this and talking about um, finding the right dose of the right statin uh, to meet the preventive needs, uh, whether it be primary or secondary prevention. So now as we get into the guidelines um, in terms of managing uh, cardiovascular risk, it breaks them down into two categories. So one are patients who have clinical ASCVD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, meaning patients who've had a heart attack or stent in the past, patients who've had a stroke or who have peripheral artery disease. And so let's start with those patients. And so first and foremost is the healthy lifestyle as we just talked about. And then the guidelines separate patients into those who are at very high risk and those who are not at very high risk. Either way, in both cases, it has patients except a sort of caveat for patients over the age of 75 as being on a high intensity uh, statin. Um, and then for those at very high risk, it's considering adding other medicines uh, like uh, azetamide and one called a PCSK9 inhibitor that we'll talk about to drive down to lower and lower LDL levels. Um, now, the European guidelines have gone further in recommending um, targeting LDLs down into kind of the 50s and, uh, and lower. The US guidelines have not quite gotten there, although I will tell you that I feel that data are compelling to get down to lower LDL levels, and I consistently treat these very high-risk individuals to LDLs in the 40s and 50s. And I think in clinical practice, uh, many uh, people do. 
Um, these are some of the features of that very high risk for future uh, atherosclerotic events. And it makes sense. So things like recent uh, acute coronary syndrome and that heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia that we talked about at the beginning of the talk. So now a little more complicated slide is in the primary prevention. So people who have not had um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in the past. And so you start over here. So one is that if you look at patients who have an LDL cholesterol that is greater than 190, and that's indicative of patients who have that heterozygous familiar hypercholesterolemia, that case that we talked about at the beginning of the talk, because those patients we know are at very high risk for premature atherosclerosis because they're over their entire lifetime, their bodies have been exposed to high LDL levels. In addition, you can see patients age 40 to 75 who have diabetes, and if they're high risk, a higher intensity statin. If, you do, if patients don't meet those categories, um, then you move into over here. And where you can see is that um, you encourage looking at lifetime risk, and you look at uh, encouraging lifestyle interventions, which really applies across the board. But then for patients who are 40 to 75, whose LDL are between 70 and 190, you calculate that 10-year ASCBD risk as we did with our patient that we discussed earlier. And as you recall, her risk was 6.2%. So she falls in this borderline risk category. And so then you go down and say, are there risk enhancers present? And so some of those risk enhancers may be things like family history um, or um, doing additional testing like coronary artery calcium scoring, which is mentioned here. Um, again, because does that then recategorize her into lower risk? We really just emphasize lifestyle modification or recategorize her into a higher risk um, where you might, uh, where you would be more likely to initiate a statin therapy. But in the end, this is a, a situation where the patient's preferences really come into play. And it's an opportunity for shared decision-making between the patient and their healthcare provider around you know, what's important to them and how they want to approach their risk reduction. Um, I have patients in this five to seven and a half percent range who say, um, you know what, doc, if I take a medicine that makes me feel like someone who is sick and that really ruins my quality of life, I worry about it all day long, I, I don't want to take a medication. And in that case, I would say, you know what, let's go just work intensively on our lifestyle modification alone and, and continue to monitor it. And then there are other patients who say, you know what, I don't mind taking medicine. I want to do everything I can to reduce my risk. I, I don't mind taking a statin. And in that case, you might decide to just go ahead and start on a statin. And in the case that I mentioned, um, that woman, she actually did feel comfortable, and, and especially with her mother's history of having a heart attack at age 50, um, she decided to go ahead and go on a statin, and she did well. Although in her, a coronary artery calcium score um, would have been a very reasonable approach. Also with her family history, see, she is someone who would have been appropriate to measure something called a lipoprotein A. And I know you have a talk coming up um, a little bit later in the curriculum on lipoprotein A, which I think is a really important um, particle to understand and uh, something that's playing a bigger, bigger role in risk stratification and management of patients. So um, that brings us through our, our guideline management. And, in this last section, I'm going to talk about, you know, one novel treatment in particular. And this deals with PCSK9. And so this is a really interesting story. So um, back around 2006, a study was published which uh, identified a uh, mutation in something called PCSK9 that happened in about 2.6% of patients in the population. Um, and with this mutation, it was a nonsense mutation. And it resulted in 28% lower LDL cholesterol and 88% lower coronary heart disease, probably because those patients through their entire lifespan had been seeing that 28% lower LDL. And this PCSK9 uh, mutation relates to a protein that binds to the LDL receptor and downregulates it. So a little schematic for how this works. So uh, the liver and the hepatocytes, you have the LDL receptor. PCSK9 binds that LDL receptor and downregulates it, which is exactly what we don't want. We want that LDL receptor up there catching LDL to have it removed from the body. 
And so in a relatively short time frame, um, monoclonal antibodies were developed that bind to that PCSK9, inhibit it from binding to the LDL receptor. So those LDL receptors are still up there doing their job, uh, gathering up LDL, removing it from the body. When you look at the clinical trials, it's really pretty compelling. So this is um, with alirocumab, uh, one of the, the two FDA-approved PCSK9 inhibitors. And in addition to um, diet, exercise, and maximal tolerated statin, resulted in another 50% reduction in LDL, which is pretty remarkable. And when you look at evolocumab, the other one that's on the market, you got a similar response in LDL. So um, this can be for patients who either is statin intolerant, they're not able to take statins because of, say, uh, muscle aches, myalgias, or patients who are already on maximal statin therapy. Um, and with that, they're still not at their LDL goal. And then um, interestingly, when you do that intravascular ultrasound that I mentioned earlier in the talk, where we put a, a catheter which is, with an ultrasound probe inside the coronary artery, and we measure atheroma volume, the actual plaque, you can see that as you start getting to LDLs less than 70, you start to see shrink, uh, shrinkage in the size of that plaque, largely because of shrinking that lipid core that is in the plaque which then stabilizes the plaque. It shrinks the size, but it also stabilizes it. So it's less likely to break open and cause a myocardial infarction. So, and this is consistent with other studies which have looked at LDLs going below 70. So I'm gonna get back to this in just a couple minutes, but this is part of why um, I treat patients, particularly those who've had prior heart attacks or at very high risk down to LDL levels in the 40s and 50s. Uh, even though the U.S. guidelines have not quite gotten to that point yet. And then when you look at um, outcomes, which is uh, the main thing that we look at when we look at any medication, does it reduce cardiovascular events? Uh, both evolocumab and alirocumab have outcome studies um, to show that they reduce cardiovascular events. So um, who should get PCSK9 inhibitors? Basically, patients who have either clinical ASCVD, they've had a heart attack or stroke or procedure in the past, and or they have familiar hypercholesterolemia, and they're on maximum tolerated statin, which could be no statin if a patient has such limiting myalgias they can't be on a statin, in addition to dietary interventions, and they require additional LDL lowering. Um, the PCSK9 inhibitors, there are injections that patients give themselves, but they're really well tolerated. I have a lot of patients on these comes with kind of an easy to use kind of click pen. Um, patients just clean off, say the upper thigh with an alcohol swab, and then they do the pen, they say feels just like a little pinch, uh, really not much at all. And they only have to take it every two weeks. And there are some formulations that are just once a month. Um, the biggest limitation is generally getting the insurance to pay for it, um, but that's improved in recent years. And uh, for properly indicated patients, we're able to get that. So lastly, I'm going to end with a little bit of a hypothesis generating to get us all uh, thinking a little bit. Um, so if we say, you know, it's tough to define what exactly is a normal LDL, but if you say it's between 100 and 130, is that really right? Is that what ought to be a human's LDL? And how low should the LDL go? Well, and interesting, in the two of the PCSK9 trials, they looked at patients who got to LDL levels less than 25. And it was almost 40% of patients in one of the studies and about a quarter of patients in another. And there were no additional uh, adverse events that were seen uh, with um, this degree of LDL lowering. And if you look at a meta regression, and so this is, you know, you have to take it for what it's worth, it's uh, uh, combining these different studies. You look in primary prevention and where that line intercepts zero coronary heart disease events is an LDL of about 57. And then if you take that same approach for secondary prevention, so studies in patients who already had coronary heart uh, events or strokes, that uh, number gets to be about 30. Um, so it suggests that, you know, we perhaps need to be treating patients to lower and lower LDL levels. And this is one of my favorite slides, which um, I got from my uh, mentor, Michael Davidson, which um, sums up the LDL levels in non-human mammals um, and in humans. And so if you look at non-human mammals, most of them have LDLs less than 25. You know, even when you look at uh, sort of uh, carnivores like cats and 
you know, here are lions, fidelity LDLs at 50. And then when you look at humans, even newborns have their LDLs in the 50 range. And we say normal adults, if, you know, depending how we define normal LDLs, 100 to 130, may be too high. And then here are familial hypercholesterolemia, heterozygotes, and homozygotes. Um, and so it really asks the question of what is the normal or the appropriate level of LDL for humans? And I think that there's probably good evidence that LDL should be in, you know, less than 100, probably in the somewhere in the 50 to 70 range. And in fact, looking at some hunter-gatherer populations, there are suggestions that their LDLs are lower in that range. Um, and if we think about, um, you know, what humans in their natural state are, we are, you know, for uh, millions of years, we are hunter-gatherers. Um, but uh, a lot of the anthropology would suggest we're probably pretty lousy hunters. So maybe we would kill and eat some animals sometime, but most of the time we were, you know, gathering nuts and berries and, um, you know, and, and vegetables and, and fruits. And that was probably the majority of our diet. Um, and it was a widely varied diet as well. And so that's probably a better indicator of what is the normal or appropriate diet for humans. And I think with that, it would suggest uh, probably lead to LDL levels in that 50 to 70 range, or maybe even lower. And so again, hypothesis generating, but suggesting where we can get to, um, to really reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And when we think about this, again, from a prevention standpoint, um, we can do very well with lifestyle interventions. And you talk about that whole foods, plant-based diet, uh, exercise, um, that gets us closer to perhaps what we ought to be in really reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. So with that, I will stop. Thank you all so much for your attention and uh, really looking forward to any questions, comments and the discussion. So thank you. Thanks, Lee. Oh, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I'm just going to reiterate all of that. Ditto. <laughs> I totally agree. Um, and I know there are a lot of really great people in this audience to ask questions. Uh, we've got the newly minted Dr. Kalia and uh, Julie Wett, who's actually my right hand in the nutrition program. So I'm sure we will have lots of great questions. If you want to unmute, it's a small enough group to do that, or you can put them in the chat. Hi, Dr. Borden. Um, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I was uh, curious if you integrate genetic testing into your clinical practice, you know, what barriers you foresee of integrating genetic testing um, into care? Yeah, that's great. Well, congratulations, Dr. Kalia. Thank you for the question. So I, you know, I get this question from patients. Um, I do not do genetic testing. Um, because I think that uh, we're able to get the same information from pretty standard, you know, very inexpensive history taking, um, and and then also from standard lipid panels. Um, you know, there are so for something like heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, um, you know, there are kind of um, more simplified ways of assessing it. So, is there a family history of premature atherosclerosis? and then is an LDL greater than 190 at baseline, assuming that they're not eating like cheeseburgers every meal of the day, you know, that they have semi-reasonable diet. And that's a pretty good estimate for heterozygous familiar hypercholesterolemia and that we want to be more aggressive in the risk factor, factor modification. There are also um, uh, scoring systems. There's like the Dutch Lipid Clinic scoring system where you can add up different points and see um, you know, their risk. Um, the genetic testing, there are actually a collection of genetic defects that can lead to what we phenotypically see as familial hypercholesterolemia. So most of them are, um, most of them are defects in the LDL receptor, but some of them are also defects in uh, apolipoprotein B. Um, and, you know, I guess clinically, I just don't find it, it changes the management all that much, but a great question. We have a question in the chat from uh, Carol Rentes. Uh, do you see particle size lab results being used more in the future? Yeah, that, this is a really good question. Um, so when I uh, finished my training in, in lipidology, I used to order a lot of these. And, um, and just, uh, I guess, to level set, so everyone knows what this is, um, particle size testing is a more advanced lipid profile. And so 
what it does, it, it looks at a variety of different things, but it um, one of the main things it looks at are the LDL particles. You have um, some larger, more buoyant LDL particles, and then you have some smaller, more dense LDL particles. Those smaller, more dense LDL particles is called pattern B. The larger, more buoyant ones is called pattern A. That pattern B of the small, dense particles um, puts someone at higher uh, cardiovascular risk. It's more atherogenic. Um, so it is another risk uh, stratification tool. In general, those small, dense LDL particles correlates with um, people who are uh, overweight or obese, have diabetes or impaired uh, fasting glucose, have high triglycerides and low HDL. And so, um, you know, I think kind of similar to Dr. Kalia's, my response to Dr. Kalia's question, I'm able to get most of that information by doing a history of physical exam and by um, measuring an HDL and a triglycerides. So I don't order many of them. Uh, I was, so I stopped ordering more of them. And then it was interesting, the National Lipid Association, which has many of the people kind of did a lot of the fundamental work in that actually came out with a statement that they actually found it was not all that useful. Um, and so there are some rare circumstances where I do, but um, and certainly I have patients who come to me who had them for that test ordered in other, by other uh, providers, um, but I, I don't order it too frequently, but it, it is a question that comes up quite a bit. Yeah, great question. Lisa, you have a question. Um, I'm a, a genetic counselor by training, so I have to admit I was a little um, struck by your comment that you don't include genetic testing, but I completely appreciate what you're saying, that the clinical presentation is really going to give you a lot of that information. But I guess I'm just curious if um, you see value in identifying other family members, um, perhaps younger children, you know, adult children of some of your patients who may, of course, if they carry the mutation, would then have an even earlier opportunity to to get um, preventive measures, even if their LDL has not reached a certain level. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a that's an important point, and mm -hmm. I do counsel all of the patients on family screening. So all the patients who have heterozygous FH, I counsel them that uh, their children need to be tested, and the pediatric guidelines recommend that starting at age two in these settings, that patients mm -hmm. get lipid panels drawn. Um, you know, at the very minimum to understand the risk. But then to do, you know, dietary uh, exercise changes in childhood. Children do get started on statins. Uh, I have to say, you know, that's very much in the realm of my pediatric lipidology colleagues. I, you know, I'm not a pediatrician, um, but it that does play a role. And I also then recommend count by screening of siblings and if siblings are positive. So following, you know, what uh, Dr. Schwartz, you you know well, and and um, doing that screening. And then I mentioned this other one, lipoprotein A, which you're going to have a talk on coming up. That's another one that when I identify that, because it is genetically inherited, um, that I do um, recommend family screening for. But, um, you know, I, I'm open to being convinced otherwise, but thus far I've done this mostly just phenotypically. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm just, like I said, biased because of my own background. Thank you. That's a, a good question, Lisa. Thank you. I have a question for you, Bill. Uh, you mentioned several times the importance of, as I would re refer to, the area under the curve in terms of exposure, their lifetime exposure to these, but almost exclusively we are looking at a single time point or at best a short period of time for people, even in terms of research. Uh, and so how do we rectify that? Or how can we understand what their true risk is, given that it's not necessarily dependent on what their current blood levels are? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's one of those where you have to sort of, you know, integrate, you know, all this together. And that's where, you know, when looking at the decision, and a lot of this comes down to this decision of do you start a statin or not? And that's where it's this, um, for these intermediate risk people, it's are there risk enhancers and having that conversation. So for example, if there's a patient who said, you know, through my 20s, um, I was really obese and and I smoked. And then I just totally changed. I turned 30. I totally changed my lifestyle. I lost a ton of weight. I quit smoking. And so now their numbers may all look great. But how do you take it into effect that decade of their life when they really had a very unhealthy lifestyle? And so that's um, you know, just kind of uh, 
some of the, the art of medicine of incorporating some of that. Now, you could do something like a coronary calcium score, um, you know, to say, do a snapshot and say, you know, okay, you had 10 years of unhealthy lifestyle. Now you've had, say, 20 years of a healthy lifestyle. How do you compare to other people your age in terms of calcium buildup um, as a way to kind of assess what their current state is? That was very helpful. Thank you. Does anyone else have, have any questions? Feel free to unmute or put them in the chat. Well, while you're thinking, just a, a plug in for the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. So for those of you who are involved in the GW Medical Enterprise, we are a resource for you to help you improve these things in yourself. Uh, because uh, unfortunately, caregivers don't always care for themselves. And so that's what we're here as the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center to help you with. Um, so if you got a little inspiration today from Bill's talk about maybe I do need to take a little bit better care of myself so I can decrease my risk we can perhaps assist you with that. Of course, you can also uh, make an appointment with uh, with Bill Borden. You know, I'm sure he would be happy to help you as well. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you all. Thank you, Lee, for inviting me and for putting together this series. Um, I'm looking forward to joining some of the future talks. Um, it's really fantastic. And I, I love the multidisciplinary approach and um, because as we sort of talked about, uh, you know, all of science, but I think particularly in the prevention realm, it really is multidisciplinary. It's a team effort. So thanks for all the work that you all are doing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.